you folks tell me, how can a known poison that exists in our food supply or medications and sometimes even in the air you breathe be totally overlooked as the cause of disease in America? Watch me now and soon you too will know the cause. Wow, I, I like that opening. Who did that opening? Wow, is my hair messed up? Sorry. Got a haircut. <clears throat> so much I want to talk to you about today. Number one, our dear friend John is under the weather. His wife, for a few days, felt kind of punk and went and bought a, a, in one of the pharmacies, went and bought one of these at home, which I love, these at home COVID tests, uh, took it, and it uh, came up positive. And uh, so she went to the doctor. She had the uh, PRC uh, test done. Uh, and uh, or PCR uh, test done and it uh, came up positive also she's fine <clears throat> but in the next day their daughter who was with them and John John contacted me and said it's positive I'm pregnant uh, his COVID test came back positive he went to a, a <clears throat> little uh, uh, doctor out there where they live and a little office not a little doctor a little office and they uh, followed up with a uh, test, and it was positive too. So John's been out. I haven't seen John in about five days, but <clears throat> he did send me this today. A lot of people are praying for me and John, and you don't know, folks, we feel it. I mean, I, I couldn't continue in this job if I didn't feel that there are a lot of people on television, this venue, other venues, that. Uh, really like what I'm doing, and I'm so appreciative, and so is John. I'm taking a week off from Know the Cause. This is John, because my wife and daughter contract, uh, uh, contracted COVID somehow. I went in to test because I was starting to have a little cough. Yes, I'm told I'm positive. And uh, because I was in touch with the other COVID carriers, whatever that meant. My symptoms are nothing like they were in 2019. John and I had COVID in the year 2019. <clears throat> Slight cough, temperature, my blood, uh, temperature and blood pressure are normal. This is like a normal cold I used to get years ago and I'd still go to work, but because of the fear, I will honor that and stay home. We're careful here at home with each other. We wash our hands. I'm taking vitamin C, D3, still taking drops of grapefruit seed extract, keeps my lungs clear. Naps, I love John's, uh, naps are nothing like they were in 2019. <clears throat> Both John and I, by the way, I also took a COVID test and it came back negative. Uh, Both John and I, when we had COVID two years, just about two years ago now, two years ago in a few weeks, uh, we slept. I froze. We slept. I didn't eat. Uh, just loaded supplements and so forth. Um... Da, da, da. Vitamin C, da, da, da. It keeps my lungs. Naps are nothing like the 2019 naps that used to last three hours. I'm not exhausted with this. I have to keep my immune system strong, so I take beta glucan, caprylic acid, along with the good vitamins before I got COVID. I still work out three to four times a week. I called him the other night and said, How, How's your wife? And he said, Oh, uh, she and John's daughter are out for a two mile walk. Um, I'm feeling fine, but I'm taking it seriously. Thanks for your prayers for our family. I always desire that God's will be done in these cases and not mine, says Miller. Uh, Miller Cray is sitting in for Miller, a, a young guy who just is wonderful at producing and editing. And We're in good hands. Then we got Damon on the board out front there doing everything right. Folks, <clears throat> I want to launch this way today. When I met John 18 years ago, he weighed about 100 pounds more than he does now. Um, he had no exercise program. He took no supplements. He ate the standard American diet. There's an acronym for everything in medicine. SAD is standard American diet. Sad, ironic, huh? <clears throat> and I worked with him gently and in the first year, I think he lost 50 pounds, second year another 50 pounds. Um, and he takes supplements that we all take around here. He eats a totally different diet than he used to eat. Uh, and he works out hard. This guy can lift uh, 325 pounds, like reps of 10, 15. He, I've watched him work out. He works out hard. Um, 
and I, I wore this shirt today. I know it's a little ratty. It's got some holes in it, as you see. But I wore this shirt today, really in John's honor. You can't read it, maybe. But it says 1986 Finisher. This I lived in Manhattan Beach, California. And every year, they have the old hometown fair. Remember that? Those of you who live in Redondo, Hermosa, Manhattan, Marina del Rey, out in that area, the South Bay. <clears throat> uh, this was the last year I ran the 10K there. 1986, that's 37 years ago. John got it 19 years ago, 18 years ago. I don't know how long he's worked here. Let's say 20 years. John got it. And he bought my story hook, line, and sinker. And we watched him. His only complaint was, I got to buy new pants, right? The shirts don't fit right anymore. The guy looks like a rock. I mean, he looks like a football player. Um, and he, he, he's doing it. You have a choice. I'm not a doctor. Nobody should believe me and go around their doctor, right? But I've taught so many people so much and I feel so privileged to have helped so many. I feel like it's been a blessing. I started 50 years ago when I got back from Vietnam. Wow, October 5th is today's date. October 4th, 1968 was my first day in boot camp. Wow. So it's been, what, 53 years ago I began boot camp. Then medical training, emergency medicine, that was a hoot. Uh, then Vietnam, not a hoot. And uh, when I got back from Vietnam, I was sick. And all the king's drugs and all the king's doctors and all the king's horses couldn't put me back together again. It was that, watching my dad lose his leg and his hip to cancer, and a whole bunch of other events that I said, holy cow, could we be responsible for our own health? Not that guy with the stethoscope. Could we be responsible for getting sick or not? And I began to question everything. Now remember, I'm in the field. I'm working in hospitals. I'm working, at that time I went to work, right when I uh, got out of the military, I went to work with a guy named Howard Gottschalk, G-O-T-T-S-C-H-A-L-K. Howard was a Cook County, Chicago medical doctor, the kindest, most wonderful man I had ever met. He was an ear, nose, and throat doctor who listened to his patients. Around that time, guys, I'm starting to get it. An engineer brings in aged milk that when his mother tells him to take a couple teaspoons, he keeps it in the refrigerator, take a couple teaspoons, he, he doesn't need allergy shots. Aged milk, who, 50 years ago, what were probiotics, right? All we knew was antibiotics. A patient uh, tells Dr. Godshock that she was on Nystatin, knowing it was antifungal, she suspected because she had been blowing out with all this stuff, some black strands, and she said it reminded her of fungus. So Dr. Godchalk asked Bob, the pharmacist downstairs in the medical building over in Westchester, California, if he would crush up some nice statin, add a little salt water, and boom, her allergies are gone. I'm learning. I'm a sponge. I'm absorbing everything I'm hearing. Howard Godchalk listened to his patients. The best doctors in the world listen to their patients, and there aren't many of those. There are a lot of very bright people, but they bought their medical training hook line, and sinker. We're not smart enough to know the cause of anything, so let's treat each symptom with a chemical. Oh, by the way, will you, Mr. Drug Company, uh, pay me to uh, write some reports for you? Sure we will. When you consider half of the budget of the FDA, what is it, $30 billion, is covered by the pharmaceutical industry, you and I justifiably would have been turned over our dad's knees and smacked. Cheating is okay today. It's just okay. I'm deeply worried. I began, I began to read medical journals long ago, and they began thanks to Barbara Starr. Was that her name? Barbara Starr, Journal of the American Medical Association, be began to blow the whistle on her own publications. Wait a minute. These are people paying us money and they're doing the research. The pharmaceutical, how do we know COVID vaccines are safe? They said so. Who would question that? High IQs, very bright people. So what I wanna do in pointing this all out to you is 
give you an analogy that I think I gave you a couple of months ago. It was on TV, uh, or it may not have aired yet. I don't know what John's schedule is, or the guy's. <clears throat> but I report this. <laughs> Do you know who this is? Can you guys see that? Kyle Drew. Call you later, Kyle. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, December of 2008, what's that, 10 months ago, reports this. A large study regarding omega-3 fatty acids. The effect of high-dose omega-3 fatty acids versus corn oil on major adverse cardiovascular events in patients at high cardiovascular risk. Yeah, who, whoever brought up that omega-3 fatty acids should be given to people who were in ICU with heart attacks. But this study went on. Uh, da, da, the strength, randomized clinic, oh, it was strong, the strength. Study participants were on a statin drug therapy, of course, <clears throat> and also received either omega-3 fatty acid supplements or corn oil. You and I know the meaning of that, right? <clears throat> Their conclusion? Among statin-treated patients at high cardiovascular risk, the addition of omega-3 uh, omega fatty acids, oh gosh. That, by the way, is somebody you guys probably all know, Stephen Sinatra, Dr. Stephen Sinatra. Uh, he and I are supposed to talk at 4.10, and he's calling me at 3.10. So, wonderful man, by the way. I love this guy. Uh, ta, 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 ta. Among statin treated patients at high cardiac, with the addition of omega 3 fatty acids compared with corn oil to usual background therapies, I don't know what usual background therapies are, resulted in no significant difference in a composite outcome of major adverse cardiovascular events. These findings do not support the use of omega 3 fatty acid uh, formulations to reduce major adverse cardiovascular event events in high risk patients nor would anyone who manufactures fish oil, likely including God, ever say, if they're in ICU and have had a heart attack or 90% occlusion of carotid artery because of atherosclerosis, fish oil is going to fix them. And yet that's where this study went. What does every physician read? Oh, omega-3 fatty acid doesn't work. Keep them on statins. Now, folks, I did a little more research for you. This was the list. Why did a study like this take 22 physicians to write? And I, I deleted the final paper because you couldn't read it. I put it on TV. There were a hundred, those 22 doctors, there were over a hundred drug companies, statin companies, some of them, that funded this study. Look, grease that wheel any way you want. I'm telling you something fishy, excuse the pun, is going on here. 22 powerful cardiologists said, ah, those omega-3s. That's not what it said at all. Folks, I take omega-3 fatty acids. I'm not promoting anything here. I want to bring you this show as transparent and innocent as I can. <clears throat> the second, I don't take money from any advertiser for talking, any of my TV advertisers, for talking about what I t oh, talk about on TV. But I want you to know all's not right in the halls of science. All is not right. And it starts with educating physicians not knowing the word mycology. Oh, bacteriology. Oh, you know, virology. Oh, sure. But not, it's just my guess multi-billion dollar drugs called antibiotics are taught to be prescribed starting when these kids are 23 years old and you prescribe a lot of them. Shh. They're mycotoxins. They're fungal metabolites that are poisonous. Thank God they're poisonous. They kill tiny bacteria in tiny doses. Woe is the doctor who prescribes lots and lots and lots tiny organisms are rendered harmless with tiny doses of mycotoxins. Bigger organisms, like we are, are rendered harmless 
with big doses of mycotoxins. We now know <clears throat> that the incidence of cancer rises and the severity of cancer rises of the most common cancers we humans suffer from when lots of antibiotics are thrown into the equation. Okay? Now I bring you that study just to tell you we need to be careful. If you're living the good life the way I am, spent the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, with Rex, with my three and a half year old grandson, with his mom and my wife uh, out here while my son traveled and, and so forth. My life is so exquisite that at 71, pretty soon, very soon, 72, I got on our driveway. We have a big winding driveway and it flows downhill on each side and we get these little tiny cars and trucks and we roll them down and see who can make it almost to the street. And to think that I could do that and then pick up a hundred little cars and to play puzzles and play games that the games kids have today are wonderful. And to watch, you know, FaceTime, uh, FaceTime, no, watch um, screen time, the boys call it, anything on a screen, um, is abs... Gosh. I should have probably told people. Let me shut this off. Sorry about this, folks. My phone goes all day, and I, I apologize. I didn't shut it off. Um, to live the life like I live, to eat the foods I eat, to be able to play the way I play, to be able to work out the way I work out, to be able to do this, to talk to you, um, is amazing. It's amazing. I don't want to retire. I don't want to wind down because there's too much information in here. <clears throat> the Center for Disease Control and the American Academy of Pediatrics published this four months ago, June 10th, 2021. CDC confirms 226 cases of myocarditis after COVID-19 vaccination in people 30 and under. Then you read this it's such tiny print. Dr. So-and-so made a presentation Thursday to the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee where he said across all ages, 789 cases of myocarditis or pericarditis have been reported from the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines, most commonly after the second dose. Uh, they're predominantly seen in young males, da 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 So we went from 226 to 789 to this uh, folks um oh i wish i'd have copied that i didn't oh you'd be amazed i'll tell it to you tomorrow um med page today is an organization that used to let people like me enter and talk uh, they don't anymore they censor the only doctors and nurses which is fine it's their baby they get to name it uh, can, uh, you know, go in and, and give responses. Here's a headline. Today, was it? Yeah, today. Post-vaccine myocarditis, fairly benign, even in a diverse population. Now, just hear me. A study in a relatively diverse population reaffirmed acute myocarditis as a rare <sighs> and fairly mild event affecting young men after COVID-19 and, I'm sorry, uh, mRNA vaccination. There were 15 confirmed cases. I'm a physician reading this. There were 15 confirmed, 15 out of millions. But Doug doesn't stop there. Doug goes a step further. There were 15 confirmed, case, confirmed cases of myocarditis over a 10-day observational study window among more than 2.3 million Kaiser Permanente Southern California adult members vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2 from December 2021 to uh, December 2020 to July, so seven months. It says there's 15 confirmed cases. Then you see 2.3 million Kaiser per Well, that's nothing. But you keep reading. Two myocarditis cases after the first vaccine dose translated into an incidence of 0.8 cases per million first dose recipients. So I did the math. 0.8% times a million is 8,000 
cases used to be 200 to 800 myocarditis in children just a few months ago. But I continued. The two myocarditis cases after the first vaccine dose translated into an incident. Do the math. You guys are much better at math than I am. Help me out here. <clears throat> uh, cases after first vaccine dose <clears throat> translated into an incidence of 0 0.8 cases per 1 million first doses. Do the math, folks. 10% or 1% of a million is 10,000, right? Yeah, 10% would be 100,000. 1% 1 is 10,000. This is 0.8, so it's 8,000 cases of myocarditis. After the first injection? What about after the second? It continues. And the 13 cases after a second dose represents 5.8 cases per million of the second dose. I did the math on that. Obviously, it's easy. 5,800 cases. You add those together, folks, and you get 13,800 cases of myocarditis. 14%? Is that okay? I can see why, um, let me wear both sides of this shirt. I can see why people jumped at the chance to help fellow man and get a vaccine. I can see why I just heard something that almost 50% of Texans have been fully vaccinated, almost 50%. I can see why people are thinking this through, but I'm a Vietnam vet. I'm always trying to help out another person. I'm in it for you guys. We were taught that before we went to Vietnam. That life is important. You take care of them, Doug. A couple thousand Marines out there, and I did, to the best of my uh, knowledge. It's great that we're a country that wants to protect those around us. We'll talk more about this tomorrow uh, because I have a report that I have to read you. Post-vax myocarditis, fairly benign. Myocarditis, pericarditis, endocarditis. <clears throat> endocarditis is when the valves of the heart are inflamed or infected. Uh, peri means around. The heart is contained in a sac. Pericarditis is infection or inflammation of the peri, the sac the heart's sitting in, right? And myocarditis, myo means muscle. So myocarditis is when there's an infection or an inflammation in the heart. Myocarditis is a serious condition, folks. I don't want to go further with this, but, but the more I read, all but one had complained of chest pains, uh, chest pains in the days immediately after the COVID vaccine. I'm really happy that MedPage published this. How do doctors learn? But when I read the opening that 2.3 million Kaiser Permanente Southern California adult members vaccinated for COVID in a six month period, 15 cases confirmed. No, no, no. They pulled out 15. You got to do the math to know almost 14% of people end up with just this symptom or just this illness. And so for those of you who have gotten it, God bless you. I trust you're doing well. I'm happy for you. For those of you who are waiting, don't let them name you. Folks, medical science has been naming opponents and competitors for all the years I've been in it. You know what we call anything that competes with allopathic medicine? One word. Quack. If it walks like a dug and it talks like a dug, it's probably a dug, right? Now we have brand new anti-vaxxers. You know, we have ugly words being thrown out. They're great at this. They're great at this. Let it be, okay? Then this, and I, I set the stage here a little bit erroneously, but I want you to know it should have opened with this. Some epilepsy drugs linked to cardiovascular disease. Same publication. This one came out the same day. They don't question this. Long-term enzyme-inducing anti-seizure medications. We're in medicine now, so it's called ASMs. Uh, anti-seizure medications. Thank you, sir. Oh, wow. <laughs> I want to see you run back there. 
Um, Anti-seizure medications were linked to higher incidence of cardiovascular disease in people with epilepsy. Adult epilepsy patients who received four consecutive enzyme-induced anti-seizure medications after 1990 were 21, one in five, 21% more likely to develop all-cause cardiovascular disease. What does this tell you? These were on the market for decades. People took them. Well, they ended up in the hospital having a cardiovascular event. Why wouldn't our FDA know this before? Be a deep thinker. Be a deep thinker. We tend to trust. When I began this show, I cautioned you that I'm a guy who doesn't trust uh, very well. I've worked in operating rooms, I've worked in battlefields, um, and uh, I'm a guy who questions things. I see new drugs, I see old drugs 20, 30 years later saying, whoops, uh, sorry, we may have induced 20% of cardiovascular illness. Where's your trust lever today? If this is 50%, when I started this show, where was your trust level in science, in medicine? Along comes this, uh, this disease called COVID. Where's your trust lever today? 30, 50, 90? A lot of you are saying, no, I'm, I'm good with this. This was ugly. It came aboard. Kaufman believes, you know, some bats and some virologists got together with, uh, uh, you know, bat poop and, and viruses and boom, a histoplasma-induced virus was born. Others have other theories. Uh, some say this is extremely nefarious. They were working on this for years. I don't know the answer. Where's your trust monitor now? Way up or way down? Now, I'm going to, uh, we're going to talk about this more in the future. Uh, certainly tomorrow, I think we should. Folks, many of you have asked me, and I've just never taken the time to do this, what I do for snacks, okay? Uh, Cray, I don't know if that camera, did you hook up the camera? Oh, you did. Okay, good. See if you can put that on, that camera. Good, thanks. These are beef sticks. They're really, really good. Maybe for six months I've been eating these. You keep a couple of them in your car. You peel them back. Let me peel one back for you because you know on my ride home, I keep these all over the place. I keep them at the office. I keep them at home. The grandkids love them. Um, and this one obviously isn't a peel, so I'll start up here. There you go. That's what it looks like. There's a little stick. This is grass-fed beef sticks. And I want to read you the ingredients. And by the way, they don't give me a penny. I don't make a dime per bottle sold, or per stick sold. Uh, this is something I want you to know. So many have asked you, what do I do? Do I have a favorite bar? Do I have a favorite stick? Yes, I do. Water is my favorite uh, drink next to this wonderful tea. Grass-fed, grass-finished beef. How good does it get? Lemon peel, sea salt, encapsulated lactic acid. Hmm, it's a probiotic, bacteria. Cultured celery juice powder, garlic powder, onion powder, white pepper, ginger, black pepper in the beef collagen casing. It's just delicious. And I don't just get this one. I have a hot one now with peppers in it and so forth. Uh, that is a little beef stick I love. This is a bar I just love. This one is called... Chocolate Coconut Cashew. Chocolate Coconut Cashew. And these sometimes I eat for lunch. I might have uh, some Keto Med and a chocolate uh, bar here. Um, doo -doo, doo -doo. Oh, I read it on the, I read it on this. There was a box. I just got another box of these. Okay. Uh, very simple ingredients. If you're a Kaufman one -er, if you got cancer, lupus, autoimmune disease, um, this has dates in it. Uh, this has dates, almonds, coconut, cashew, cacao, 
extra virgin coconut oil, Himalayan pink salt, and pecans. Um, this is, uh, this is, I think, as good as it gets. And I love these. They are tremendous. So as I'm driving to Austin later this week, I will take two or three of those, two or three of those. The drive down takes four hours. The drive back takes, you know, four hours. And I'll eat a few of these. So I wanted you guys to know that. Steve. I like Steve. Doug, my dad, was just diagnosed with dementia and possible multiple myeloma. Would Dr. Brunk's stem cell treatment work for these maladies, or should dad do the Kaufman protocol? You can use these together. Uh, Steve, I often, I remember doctor, two of the doctors I worked with in the past, uh, right here in Dallas. <laughs> we used to say, Doug was at the supplements. You know, you were putting them on caprylic acid and beta-glucan decades ago. Um, was it the nice statin? Was it the diflucan? Was it your diet? And one of the doctors said, do we care? This patient is diametrically different than they were two weeks ago. Do we care? Let's keep them on all the same, which we did. Now, folks, you can begin pulling off the drugs, nystatin, if the doctor uh, sees uh, to it. Ask the doctor if you can come off the nystatin, then the diflucan, but stay on you know, the beta-glucan, the caprylic acid. And once you're feeling better, it's okay to eat some date. It's okay to have a red apple. See if those provoke the symptoms to come back. Uh, Steve, <clears throat> dementia. What do we know about dementia? Nerve cell inflammation, nerve cell death, possible multiple myeloma. Um, I would probably, Steve, start the Kaufman protocol, and I would ask the doctor uh, if you could get diflucan, multiple myeloma, uh, no, Spornox, and I also talked to the doctor about infused stem cells, not aborted cells. Um, I would opt, I always would opt for uh, cord blood cells, and that's what Dr. Brunk has. Um, Gosh, I see no negative to starting them together. Certainly, Dr. Brunk understands my program, and he's got centers now all over the United States. So, um, gosh, I'm sorry to hear that, Steve. Uh, but I know with you helping out, I, I know uh, you'll get Dad to resolve these problems. Wow. <clears throat> Nini says, is it true that caprylic acid is good for toenail fungus? If so... ML, uh, and dosage is best. Thanks so much. Caprylic acid, I just read you that these little, they're called Thunderbird. Isn't that cute? Thunderbird, real food, unreal taste. I agree. They have coconut in them. Uh, coconut has two medium chain fatty acids, lauric, L-A-U-R-C acid, and caprylic acid. Uh, both are powerful antifungals. Uh, to the extent Remember, supplements are a little bit different than something like Spornox that breaks the blood-brain barrier and gets into the ear and gets into the toenail and begins eating away at these things. It always takes longer. I've never seen oral uh, supplements work like that on uh, nail fungus. This is deeply embedded uh, condition, fungal condition. And uh, usually Spornox within three months, there's improvement. Uh, but the flip side is doctors believe that Spornox can induce hepatotoxicity, liver toxicity. And so there are very, uh, so many things. And there are very good fungicidal um, products on the market today. Unfortunately, I, I could tell you to try one of them. Uh, but your thumbprint might be different than the person I know who tried one of them. Buy a couple of them at a time. Use one for 10, 12, 14 days. And if you don't see breakthrough, use the next one for 10, 12, 14 days. You'll find your thumbprint, Nini, and thank you for writing in. <clears throat> so many are in horrible pain, uh, Connie. Uh, do I know anything about PAD, peripheral artery disease? Peripheral 
artery disease. What's the cause? What could possibly be living and get inside our body and begin inducing serious peripheral artery disease, serious symptoms, bacteria, viruses, fungi. So if I had an interior disease and the cardiologist was telling me, I'll ask uh, Dr. Sinatra about that, and the cardiologist was telling me that um, we don't know what the cause is, I'd ask the doctor if we could try olive leaf extract. I've always loved olive leaf because the olive leaf doesn't care in a petri dish whether it's viral, bacterial, or fungal. Poof. Enough. Enough of it. Yeah, how much do you weigh? What's your medical condition? You know, what's your diet like? That's how we would determine the, the requirement for something like olive leaf extract. But I would ask my doctor, if this is you, Connie, which I doubt. Uh, I see Connie all the time up there posting and having fun. Um, I would try a change diet. Uh, you know, the little bacteria don't have to eat, the little viruses don't have to eat, but the fungus does. So on the off chance that this is a peripheral artery uh, fungal infection, I would, um, I would starve it with a Kaufman 1 diet, and I would ask the doctor if I could take a couple olive leaf extracts, maybe three times a day, and then report back to the doctor that diagnosed the disease to see if there is improvement on down the line. There are so many people, Connie, if you folks could see my emails <clears throat> in one week, uh, they're good because I, a lot of people are working with alternative doctors and even alternative doctors don't understand fungus. And so I'll ask these people, I got two of them today, two glowing reports. I ask these people to talk with their doctor about changing and going off that and trying this. And uh, this was uh, a month ago, one of these people, and then just the other day, another of these people. And they both gave me thumbs up, doing so much better, thank you so much. Um, do you remember when I say we're kind of on our own kids? If you have a serious, if you're bleeding from somewhere you shouldn't be bleeding from, time to get to a doctor, right? If you grow a bump, huge bump, could be a lipoma, therefore non-infectious, it's a fat bump. But it could also be cancer. Get to a doctor, rule out anything more severe going on. But at my old age, I've learned, uh, if I've got something going on, think about it. If I'm constipated, oh yeah, birthday party, cake, ice cream, etc. Um, what are you laughing about, <laughs> Damon? <laughs> Damon walks up laughing. At least you're getting some pleasure out of this, Damon. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, just know that. In horrible pain, I think about relieving the pain. I don't know anything about this, you know, gawk, uh, anti-pain stuff that you see all the time on the radio. I might try it. I love CBD. If I were in pain, I would probably use CBD. I use it to help me sleep on occasion. After you've babysat for three days, I use it to help me sleep. Um, Kathy asks an interesting question. Hi, Doug and John. I miss seeing you live since I started working full time. Congratulations on that. Is it possible that gangrene, gangrenous tissue, uh, has a fungal etiology? A friend of mine has diabetes and some toes amputated. IV antibiotics didn't help. So, um, as you know, with a disease like diabetes, we get everything from peripheral neuropathy to gangrenous toes, feet, etc as the disease takes over the body. I wrote a book almost 20 years ago with Dave Holland, Dr. Holland, um, called The Fungus Link to Diabetes. Kathy, we, when new diabetes drugs come onto the market, and drugs come onto the market all the time, and I don't mean to roll my eyes, some of them are quite effective at, at helping the symptoms go away for four to six hours till you take another one. I'm a guy who wants to dig. I want to know the cause. I don't want to take a pill to help me for three or four hours. Yes, I do, until I can figure out the cause, right? So easy, folks. Medicine is so convincing. Go on this pill, 
oh my gosh, I have range of motion now. This is awesome. What is this pill? Well, it's acetaminophen. I'm going to stay on this the rest of my life. What's it doing to your liver? Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, obviously that doctor is brilliant. He'll put me on a liver pill too. Yeah, but that causes headaches. Hey, no problem. Imitrix. I can self-inject an anti-headache. You see the way many Americans think. Okay. If I had gangrene, which is a symptom of diabetes, you need to know this. Scientists for decades have been giving rats and mice and bunnies diabetes. So we can study new medicines. It's inhumane to use them on diabetic patients. So, you know, rats don't get diabetes. We got to give them diabetes. Think about that for a second. Rats don't get diabetes. A guy in a white coat, starched, uh, has to get a medical school, has to get a, buy a thousand rats. Somebody sells rats. You buy a thousand rats, some of them are going to die, but you got to inject them with something to give them diabetes. What messes with their pancreas and the beta cells in the pancreas? Two things that I know of, right? Streptozotocin and baflomycin. These are antibiotics that are so toxic we don't use them anymore. But given their antibiotics, they're made by fungus. They're fungal mycotoxins, like we talked about penicillin uh, in the past. <clears throat> if you inoculate rats or bunnies over an extended period of time, you'll give all of them that survive diabetes. Now they're broken. Now we can try your drugs. And when they work on 800 bunnies, the FDA will look at that and say, okay, we'll you know, consider putting that drug on the market. The fact, Kathy, that we induce gangrene indirectly. We induce diabetes, which eventually induces gangrene and many other health problems. Needs to, we common thinkers need to step back, fold our arms and say, holy cow, do doctors know this? By the by, we use ibotenic acid a different fungal mycotoxin, this one a mushroom mycotoxin, to induce Alzheimer's in study rats. What? Mm -hmm. That's how we give them Alzheimer's. So when the magic pill, I think Alzheimer's is a fungal disease. We have plenty of proof it is. Shh, we need to get on medications. Okay? How do you give cancer? You use a different fungal mycotoxin. This one's called, you with me? Aflatoxin comes from aspergillus mold, two species. The point I want to make is the gangrene is just a, a symptom of the bigger picture, the diabetes. Am I crazy enough to think that you can get off insulin? I don't think you're going to be able to do that. And I understand your doctor's concern. Uh, folks, that could kill you if you stop taking insulin. But you can't believe in my reports here how many of you have written to me and said, hey, I uh, worked with my doctor, we titered the insulin down from this many units to this many units, and it, none of us can believe it, but my pancreas is working correctly, and I don't have diabetes anymore. Uh, type 2 diabetes and type 3, what is it, gestational diabetes, there's going to be a diabetes for everybody coming soon. but. Um, Type 2 diabetes is a little bit different because I think much of type 2 diabetes <clears throat> is lifestyle driven. Did any of you know Roby Mitchell, Dr. Roby Mitchell? One of the most wonderful men I ever had the blessing to have met. Roby Mitchell used to say on my show all the time, um, you can't medicate your way out of illnesses that you lifestyled your way into. I think 90% of us are guilty of that. Sometimes the sperm and egg unite and give us what we call a genetic lineage, a predisposition toward something. Rarely, I believe. I think we sold that bill of goods for decades in medicine. Mom had breast cancer, you're going to have breast cancer. You know the story. It wasn't true but it sold a lot of mammograms. Um, so, uh, Kathy, um, think seriously. I, antibi IV antibiotics didn't help. What about IV diflucan? 
Would that help? I would look, I would talk to the doctor about an antifungal. Um, the disease itself that initiates the deterioration of tissue, gangrenous tissue, may be a fungal disease. Okay. Uh, Susan says, the night of my first vaccine, I got a severe sinus headache. It was so severe. Um, can I, I, I was going to wait till tomorrow. Uh, folks, I am seeing all over, uh, you know, many of these, uh, uh, television stations, much of the internet. I'm seeing stories about a, a 40 year old who said, I'm not getting the vaccine. And now he died yesterday. So sad. He died. It's unbelievable to me that a, a, a special relationship I once had with my doctor, I can't have that anymore. Oh no, you must tell us all what you did in that office. That we have politicized Medicine has become a Republican and a Democratic business. If you're a Republican, you get ivermectin. If you're a Democrat, you get remdesivir. What has happened? What? Who blinked? Who made this happen? Talk about, here's a couple, vaccinated Michigan couple, die minutes apart from COVID-19 while holding hands. They romanticize. It's, and I'm not going to tell you where this comes from, but you've all been there. Um, it's so unbelievably disgusting to me that medicine, your pills, your shots, your examinations will soon, if they're not now, be up on the World Wide Web for anyone to look into. It's all politicized. Everything is politicized now. You took ivermectin? Yeah, it worked. Well, it couldn't have, because research says it does. You took remdesivir? Yeah, I, I swear it saved my life. Couldn't have. Couldn't have saved your life. That drug is killing. It's Stop it. Let's be happy again. I was talking with a friend the other day about riding our bicycles. We were kids. Do uh, you remember the slip and slides? I, my kids had those, that was before my time, but we used to make slip and slides with mud into a pond. You'd run fast, make sure the hose is on, and a friend of mine picked up the hose and he swallowed a slug, a snail. And do you think we have antibodies from that dirt, that mud, bird droppings in it, swallowing a slug, to everything? You're darn right we do. You're darn right we do. Okay, let's keep going. Um, Joanne, bronchiectasis, I would uh, get a bronchoscopy done by a qualified, boy that's important, a qualified pulmonologist. I have a friend here in uh, Dallas who is one, who does these, and I would ask the pulmonologist to look, for the bronchoscopy, to look for fungus. Everybody's got a bacterial problem when they have a lung problem. I would get a, I would get a, uh, a pulmonologist to do a bronchoscopy on me, looking at fungus. If it were positive, I would treat for fungus. Can a, bronchiac can a bronchiactasis patient improve on antifungals? Mm -hmm. If the etiology of the bronchiactasis is fungus. Amy asks, will beta-glucan be helpful after the vaccine? <clears throat> I've taken beta-glucan for so many years. I told you my story. I stopped in 17 while I was landing and taking off and landing and taking off and giving all these lectures. Uh, and I missed it and I ended up uh, getting the flu in 2017. Um, Beta-glucan doesn't know whether you've taken a COVID vaccine, a flu shot, uh, you know, mumps, measles, rubella shot, uh, or aspirin a day. Beta-glucan assigns itself to your immune system by recognizing foreign invaders, kind of puts glasses on the white blood cells to prep it. And by the way, it's yours free. You get a free trial, right? 10 days of it, just by going on my website, 
and they're looking at my sponsors, nsc24.com. Everybody, everybody now, I believe, whether you've had the vaccine or not, everybody, I believe, should be on beta-glucan. Thank you, Amy. Good question. Wow, this is so, Betty, uh, Beth, I'm sorry, thank you. Looking for any suggestions of dear precious friend, just been diagnosed with stage four non-small cell lung cancer with the ALK mutation. It has spread to her adrenals, ribs, liver, spine. She's only in her early 40s. Never smoked in great health otherwise. She is under the care of her doctor taking, I can't pronounce, the chemo. Every four weeks, her gums are weakening from the medication. They have advised her to see her dentist in the meantime. I've told her about you. She has purchased your book. She doesn't have Facebook, so I wanted to reach out on your thoughts on the matter. I hope I explained it correctly. Okay, uh, a healthy 40-something all of the sudden has been diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer. Man, have we had a pulmonary hit in the last two years? Uh, everything is the lung. Bronchiectasis. Uh, Joanne, just everything's the lung. I got a cough. You know, I got a... Everything is the lungs. What's going on? If this were me, I'd ask my doctor, and this is used for uh, non-small cell carcinoma. I'd ask my doctor if I could have... Did you print the two pages, print them here on Know the Cause, uh, a doctor's antifungal protocol or fungal protocol? Print the two pages, ask her to take it to her doctor and ask for two to uh, 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 100 to 200 milligrams of Spornox a couple times a day. Follow the Kaufman protocol. The question is a good one, Beth, and thank you for loving her. Is her cancer, could it have a fungal etiology? Is she living in a moldy home? Did she just move? Folks, this, I encourage you to do what doctors don't. I encourage you to take a careful history on everybody you're in love with who has a health problem. When did this begin? It's relevant, hugely relevant. When did this begin? It began two years ago. What happened two years ago? Uh, really nothing um, that I can think of did the house leak? Oh, yeah, that's right. It was during that snowstorm. And it leaked right through the fan in our bedroom, and it fell on the bed. Uh, but, you know, it's, I don't think, we blew dry the bed and everything's fine. Wow. Two years ago, Doug, I got divorced. I cried for five days. Two years ago, we had a child in the hospital, and I couldn't see. Do you see where I'm going? Something initiates cancer, whatever it is, to begin colonizing, to begin disrupting all the other DNA in all the other cells. And this isn't just in her lung, this is in her ribs, her liver, her spine. I will guarantee you something was seen on imaging. Right? Man, I wish I could recall that study. Oh, she has my book. Does she have the woman's book? In the woman's book, I tell you about a study of 27 patients, it was in the journal Lung in the year 2013. 27 patients, radiologically and physical exam, diagnosed with lung cancer. And then along came the antifungal drugs. None of them had lung cancer. Folks, trust. Um, and the medical research is replete with stories like this. Please uh, help me feel and have a little thing, a yogurt, goat yogurt, and, or a grapefruit or some eggs, and, and go to work and love my work as much as I do. If she could become me for six months, but she's handing me her. Now I'm putting up with the disease. The good news is I'm back in my early 40s. I'm putting up with a disease that's horrible. It's threatening her life. What am I doing? You know me. You know me. I'm pulling out all the stops. I think cancer, she needs to work with her doctor. I think cancer is one of the most hyper-diagnosed diseases in the world. You know me. 
I've done stories on how fungus grows in lumps and bumps and balls. There's one called an aspergilloma. Many reports in the scientific literature that an aspergilloma from breathing in her venting system in her home, aspergillus mold, can grow in a ball in her lungs. <coughs> she goes and gets an x-ray done, and he said, whoa, it looks like cancer. You got cancer there. Gosh. Yeah, Diane, I have too. I've heard that there are people taking ivermectin for cancer, and it seems to be working, and let me tell you why. It kills parasites. Did I ever teach you that fungi parasitize we humans? Wow. What's the survival rate of myocarditis? Non-fulminant active myocarditis has a mortality rate of 25 to 56 percent within three to ten years, owning the progressive heart failure and sudden cardiac death, especially if symptomatic heart failure manifests early on. These are young men. You know what bothers me most about this is the attitude, the cockiness. Oh, well, there were only 15 of two. No, there weren't. It's the ad Folks, I'll never forget one time I was talking, I don't even remember who he was, probably on my radio show. How do you account, doctor, for even the 1% that VAERS is saying gets reported? Vaccine adverse events, 1%, less than 1% get reported. That from Harvard in the year 2010. Less than 1% of these every, how do you account for that? Doug, here's what you under, need to understand. In order to do the best, the greater good for humanity, some people are going to get hurt and some are going to die. It's like a war. And I got to tell you, let me land it this way today. We'll pick this up tomorrow. Your immune system is precious. A doctor can't take care of it. Only you can. Your diet, your lifestyle choices, your exercise are the epicenter of your immune system. Take excellent care of them. I'll continue on tomorrow with this. Really good to be with you here today. Can't wait till tomorrow. God bless. Bye-bye.